Well, it's seven o'clock, and so I probably should go ahead and get through as quickly as possible. I do appreciate all of you being here. Um, it's what I want to do is essentially uh, give you a sort of reasonably lighthearted history of the college, and the framework for it is going to be the buildings that were at the college at any given time, and where they came from, and what happened to them. And we'll we'll see how this goes. Um, there's, I, I do see a bunch of familiar faces, but there are a lot of people under 40, which means they have no idea who I am. Uh, I was, I taught chemistry and Western culture here until about 10 years ago and retired. And so many of you have come since then. Um, but I've lived on campus for almost 60 years. And most of that time I've been taking pictures of the campus. And um, it turns out more changes than you might think. So we'll see. Uh, I called the talk Lost Hand and Sydney because significant pieces of our past are gone now. And uh, before I can get to any pictures, the picture started about 1840, okay? And we'll see why that is. Um, but to understand where the buildings we have came from, you need to understand what we started with. Um, Hampton City was founded to be a counterpoint to William and Mary. Uh, the revolution was obviously coming. It's the early 1770s. Uh, the rural Virginia, that's us, was full of people who wanted independence. And besides that, they were Presbyterian and Baptist and Methodist and Quaker. And William and Mary was solidly Church of England Episcopal, uh, loyal Brits in North America. Uh, didn't like the idea of independence, didn't like uh, Presbyterians. <laughs> and in fact, they had rigged Virginia law so that it was virtually impossible to build a Presbyterian church, for instance. And the Presbyterians were really mad about this. And fortunately, somewhat later, uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote the Virginia Statute for uh, Religious Liberty, which was to, intended to deal with this specific problem. And he subsequently put that on his tombstone. But in 1775, of people bad wanted to build a independence oriented uh, Protestant Presbyterian college to provide uh, Presbyterian ministers for coming years by educating properly. And you have to realize that at that point, uh, Protestant and in particular Presbyterian ministers were almost the only people who had any kind of advanced degree. They were almost the only people who went to college, but okay, so you had some people getting a liberal arts education at college. But uh, lawyers didn't go to law school. They apprenticed to a practicing lawyer, and after a while you can pass the bar exam and then you're a lawyer. Doctors apprenticed to an existing doctor. There were a few med schools, but uh, you didn't have to go to them, and they, they were mostly for people who, I don't know, wanted to specialize. And, this is, that's a little funny because I read a serious estimate some years back that said the first year in which doctors did more good than harm was 1912. So <laughs> a little funny there, but there is there are no graduate programs. You couldn't get a PhD in history or political science or anything. It didn't exist. People would not have known what you meant. And so almost all the people with advanced degrees were, you know, preachers. So if you're going to start a college, you got to have a faculty. And the faculty has to be people who have at least taken the courses before. And so the faculty at Hampton Sydney was going to be preachers, period, flat out. And uh, I don't know how many they had to begin with. Uh, by the turn of the century, they seem to have had four. And that was, that was how you covered everything, okay? And we'll see that, that having those all be preachers was okay for a while, but eventually they had to change it. Uh, they were given, the college was given about 100 acres of land, and the land was between uh, Five Forks Road, the, the road at, at the college entrance, and the very small hill that Cushing is on. So there was a kind of a slice there that was not very wide. But to get 100 acres, it goes way back into uh, 
the Wilson Trail and in the Virgin Forest, okay, when they want to put some buildings up, you, you gotta have, this is, this is all the way up in the country, you gotta have buildings. When they want to put them up, uh, they needed to be able to do it quick and cheap, and they needed to do it where the fewest trees were. And so they put them all down, uh, kind of between Hamden House and Crawley Forum, okay? Up fairly close to the road that was already there. And so these buildings are pretty close together. And if students don't walk back and forth, of course they need to be. Um, but uh, they put the buildings up as cheaply as they could. There was one brick building, but it, it was tiny. It was too small to do any good, okay? The rest of them were all cheaply constructed uh, frame construction, uh, raw boards. I have the impression they might not have been painted. Well, this went along. Uh, it worked pretty well. Uh, by uh, about 1790, the, you know, we had a peace treaty with England and uh, so we don't have to worry about the independence movement anymore. But the desire to have uh, the, the Virginia Constitution that has a statute for religious liberty in it was not here yet. There was still a huge pressure from the Presbyterian Church across the state, the Senate of Virginia, to uh, support Presbyterian Christian religious preparation. And so in the 1790s and 18 noughts, uh, Hampton City turned into a hugely religious institution. Uh, it was said by people at the time that they were having a religious frenzy here. Uh, you know about William Henry Harrison, our president who came here in the class of 1791. His father pulled him out after one year and wrote a letter to a friend in which he said, I pulled the boy out of Hampton Sydney Collins. The damn Presbyterians are ruining him. <laughs> so Everybody was not happy with this, but there, there was a huge religious emphasis. Well, okay, this went on, and we graduated people. And uh, about 1810, the board started thinking that Hampton had been running long enough. It's 35 years. Uh, Hampton had been running long enough now that it's probably a permanent institution. Um, we probably ought to think about serious permanent buildings because. 35 years of 18 year old freshmen living there had, they had kicked the board buildings to death. Uh, the, the campus was a slum. And so they started thinking about how to build a permanent campus. But now they got this real narrow wedge of land there. Yeah, it runs way back into the woods, but that's not much help. They can't tear down the old buildings and build new ones to replace them because that means shutting the college down for a couple of years. Uh, they also don't have the money to build everything at once. So, mm -hmm. so in 1814, buoyed up by just having defeated England for the second time, <coughs> big surge of confidence throughout the United States after the War of 1812. Uh, the uh, trustees went out and bought the land between the hill Cushing is on, which is College Hill, okay, between that hill and uh, Via Sacra, which was not called Via Sacra at the time. It was Sadler's Ditch, but Via Sacra does sound better. Um, they bought all of that, and it was only lightly wooded. And so it would be possible to cut down, you know, just a few trees here and put up permanent buildings. This, this was very promising. But didn't have any very good idea how to do it. And if you're going to do this, somebody on campus, I mean, the president of the college, uh, has to provide leadership. And at the time, 1810, 1814, they didn't have a lot of leadership. Okay. Uh, in 1817, the preacher who was teaching natural science either died or left, I'm not sure which, but they had to get somebody to teach the natural science courses. And chemistry and physics in 1810, 1820 were exploding, uh, not literally, they were intellectually exploding. And we probably should not trust a Presbyterian pastor to teach all the natural science courses. Let's try to get somebody who actually has a background in natural science. And at this point, for absolutely obscure reasons, which 
are fascinating, but I don't have time for them. Josiah Cushing shows up. He's from New Hampshire. Okay, he knows nothing about Hampton City, but he shows up here and announced himself as being willing to teach science courses because he's got a chemistry background. Oh, we got somebody who's actually like a professional at this. And he starts teaching, he's 24 when he comes here in 1817. Uh, by 1820, it's clear that he is more articulate and more enthusiastic and more likable than any of the three other preachers on the staff. And so when the president uh, dies in 1820, the board makes him president. You got to realize that at the time, the president was not somebody you go out and get. It's whoever the best candidate is from among the faculty. And one of the interesting features of your appointment as president was you still had to teach the full teaching load that you had anyway. And you didn't get any release time. This was like honorary, okay? <laughs> but Cushing signed up for it. And by this time it was 1820, and he was up for this building permanent canvas business. And he consulted with the board and worked out a plan. And the plan involved building three buildings. Uh, one of them, the most important one, was gonna be a big building. And we'll put that on the College Hill, the Cushing Hill, okay? wasn't when they built it it wasn't called Cushing because the college didn't name things for people until about 1900 but we'll come back to that um, he wanted the college built and this would be a big building that would have student uh, rooms dormitory rooms it would have rooms for the faculty or at least some of the faculty it would have all the classrooms it would have all the science laboratories and it would have a big uh, assembly hall for chapel and all of that would be in this building. And that's like, you know, everything the college does. Except we've got to build it. Uh, well, it's not everything the college does because at this, up to this point, I have not said anything about eating meals. We got, okay, we also have to have a dining hall. So that's the second building. And the third one, interestingly enough, is the president's house. And that seems like kind of a meaningless extra. But if you think about it, you're gonna get uh, visiting speakers and prominent people are gonna come into your college and potential donors. And you have to have someplace reasonably elegant and quiet and pleasant uh, to meet them and put them up for the night or even several nights. And uh, the president's house can do this, but a dormitory can't, all right? <laughs> so yeah, we gotta, have, we gotta have the president's house. So there are these three buildings that we have to put up and Cushing gets busy. And what they need worse is the dining hall. They already have one, but it, it is the most abused and worst condition. It, it is a shanty. And so we got to have the dining hall first. And he helps the trustees raise money and puts in some of his own money. Interesting. Um, and uh, the dining hall gets built between 1819 and 1821. So it's up and running. Uh, then they start on the, the college, the big building, and that is built in segments and takes longer to raise money for, but it gets built between 1822 and 1831, 1832, anyway. And when those two are finished, he goes to work on the president's house, and by that time, the people who give him any money are tired of giving him any money, and you will forgive by saying that the poor bastard puts in almost half the money for the president's house out of his own funds. So there. Uh, then he moves into the president's house and things are looking pretty good. He has the college up and running here. We'll see, those buildings are round, we'll see them. Uh, unfortunately, he has always had bronchitis and the severe winters, which were still severe in the 1820s and 30s. Uh, were getting to him. And in 1835, after he lived in the president's house for only two years, although he's been president for 15 years, but he's only 42 years old, okay? And he decides that he has got to move, he's got to quit the presidency and move south to get really uh, coastal South Carolina type better weather. And he's going to move to Savannah. So he resigns, he moves out, starts south, but travel in 
the 1830s in the eastern United States was still really hard. And he only got as far as Savannah before he died. Oops. Now we not only don't have a president, we don't have anybody to teach science courses. Where on earth are we going to find somebody else with a science background? Okay. Another interesting recruiting story, but a young man shows up and says, I, I got a degree in chemistry and I'd like to teach your science courses. And the board says, whoo, oh, so thank goodness. And they hire him for the summer immediately after uh, Cushing has left. This is John William Draper, and he's English. And he got a chemistry-oriented degree from the University of London. And uh, his, when he was about to graduate, he asked one of the faculty members there where he could get a job teaching and doing research in chemistry because he had some really good ideas. This was, a, this was a fascinating thing to get into. And the British faculty member said there are no openings for uh, new faculty in, in uh, Great Britain. You have to go to the States. They're building a new college every 50 miles. You, anybody can get on there. So the reason this is important to him, well, a big portion of the reason, is that his father has died, and he is the sole financial support for his mother and two unmarried sisters. Okay, and he has to get a paycheck pretty quick here. So he decides to emigrate, and he, uh, somewhere in there, Mama dies anyway, but he takes his sisters with him. And they sail into Philadelphia, and he has enough money somehow to spend a term or so at uh, the med school, because there really was one, at uh, Penn. And this gives him some advanced course background, and his resume looks better. And another fascinating story, but he shows up in Hampton, Sydney, and says, you need somebody in natural science, don't you? And they said, oh God, do we? And he said, I'm your man. And they said, well, we'll hire you for the summer and we'll see how you do. And he, he was great over the summer. The students loved him. He knew what he was talking about. It was <laughs> and a, just a very refreshing situation. Uh, <laughs> and so they, they gave him a contract for the year and said, we really like him. We'd like to have you stay here. Now they were paying him a thousand dollars a year which doesn't sound like much to you, but it was enough to buy a house with. No payments, just give them a thousand dollars and they'll give you a fairly large house to live in. So Hampton was paying pretty good at that point. Uh, however, the first year he was here, he discovered that Hampton is not along the usual supply lines. And if you think that it's hard to get stuff here now, you can't imagine what it was like trying to get stuff in uh, 1835. He needed chemicals and apparatus and stuff. And we had some. Hampson was very good uh, at uh, outfitting the college to begin with, with scientific apparatus. But when you need something new, it's virtually impossible to get it. So without telling anybody, he hears about the, a, an open job at NYU, okay? New York, let me think, I can get things there. So he gets in touch with them and says, so you got an opening? And they wrote back and said, yeah, we got an opening, but we don't have any money. But we'd really like to have you. The, the, we don't have any money. It's a phrase you're gonna hear again in this talk. Um, we'd really like to have you. Why don't you stay where you are? And as soon as we have money enough, we'll let you know and you can move to New York. So. He taught 1835-36, and he taught 1836-37, and he taught 37-38 at uh, Hampton Sydney, and he was starting on 38-39, and about January of 1839, NYU sends him a letter and says, hey, we got some money. Uh, we can give you $600 a year. <laughs> it is, we have not paid more than NYU at any time since then. Um, but he was gonna go anyhow. This man was serious about chemistry. But he didn't exactly tell him, Sydney, yet. Uh, but in January of 1839, William Fox Talbot in England gave a presentation to the Royal Society about this really fascinating process he had developed involving silver bromide in which you could uh, expose uh, a transparent uh, emulsion that had silver bromide in it to, to an image 
and chemically develop it and you'd get a negative. And then if you re-expose it again on a piece of paper, instead of a transparent piece, you get a negative of a negative, which is a positive. This, he, this man had invented pretty much the whole uh, silver black and white photography scheme. And this was sensational. There had never been anything remotely like this. So of course the Royal Society publishes it immediately in their journal. And about April, the copy of the British Journal gets to the only Brit we know here uh, who is teaching at Ham City. And he is interested in the relationship between light and chemical reactivity. And so he thinks this is sensational, which of course it was. So he sits down immediately, uh, builds a camera, uh, which we found, uh, gave the Smithsonian anyway. Um, and because he's a chemist, he knows how to make these uh, light sensitive uh, sheets, one transparent one and one paper based one. And so uh, by about early summer, 1839, he has what he's pretty sure is a working camera for this photography stuff. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, middle of the summer. When do I have to leave to get to New York by mid-September when the classes start? Um, well, here in August sometime, we don't have much time here. Well, his sisters came with him, okay? And now he's going to New York, but they're not. And, or at least in particular, one of them's not because one of his sisters in the four years he's been teaching here has married another one of the Ham Sydney faculty. Okay. <laughs> oh, so she's bolted down and she's not going anywhere. He's going, he's going to be, he doesn't know anybody in New York. He's going to be at NYU by himself. He really feels bad about this. And so what happens? is that he is the first of tens of millions of young men to get a keepsake picture of a girl they really love when they're leaving. Uh, this is his sister, Dorothy. And this, and I'm sorry about the handwriting at the bottom because half of it is dead wrong. Uh, the, the handwriting is, uh, after he got to New York, he got married and had children, and eventually he died there in about 1880. And his son went through and dug stuff out and dug out the original picture, made a copy of it. And the son thought the original was a daguerreotype. It wasn't. It was a real honest to God, uh, negative, positive uh, uh, silver print. Uh, so he got that wrong. It was Dr. John William Draper and it was 1839, but it was not on the roof of Edward Hughes building. It was in Cushing Hall. And, uh, I know that because his sister never went to NYU. She, she, she stayed here. That's it. And uh, anyway, the key to this is the 1839. This is when photography hit Europe and the United States simultaneously. And anything that was around at that point, you could take pictures of. And so there, there are lots of pictures of Parthenon and the pyramids at Giza, you know. But for example, uh, there is no picture of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. I mean, there is, but it's imaginary. Uh, it burned in the Great London Fire in 1666, and uh, people know what it looked like because it was an Norman Cathedral. It was the largest one in England, uh, and it was handsomely done, but, you know, I, <laughs> there is no big oil painting of it or anything like that, and ain't go ever going to be any photographs of it. Hampton is in that same boat because when we got the nice buildings built, the first thing we did was tear down the slums that they were replacing, okay? We even took down the brick building and took the bricks apart to, to reuse. So all of the original canvas, canvas vanished in about 1834, 35, which means about 20 minutes before you could have taken a picture of it. So, uh, Let's look at these buildings. Here is the college, and you know what that is. Uh, we think of it as Cushing, they just thought of it as the college. What they did was built, oops, uh, built first passage first, 
And by 1824, they had it done and paid for. And uh, students moved into it and they immediately tore down the building they had been living in. Then they went to work on the second and third passage, which was the section that was going to have all the educational stuff in the classrooms, the laboratories, and the chapel, the, the big assembly hall, okay? And uh, then finally, they built fourth passage, which is also dormitories down here. Now, the thing you uh, probably don't recognize in there is sitting at the far end, okay, the water tank. We don't have that anymore. But a major theme in the history of Hampton Sydney College has been trouble with water supply. Uh, the college, when it was built, didn't have running water, okay? And there is a picture somewhere, which I have seen, but couldn't get a copy of, of this building with five handsome outhouses sitting right out here, convenient to each of the four doors, okay? If you were caught at two o'clock in the morning, you could get to it in no time. Um, <clears throat> But uh, eventually, we'll, we'll hear more from that water tank as we go along. Um, I can't, uh, I can't leave Cushing Hall without uh, telling you about the Cushing 500, okay? In, uh, if you, some of you will remember this, but less than half of you. The walkway that goes diagonally up to the corner of at the front of Cushing from the uh, fence right at the gateway that lets you into the get you into uh, Graham Hall parking. Okay, there's a walkway that goes up there. That used to be a paved road. It was wider. Key key word here. Um, and um, it went up to the uh, front of Cushing at the corner went the full length of Cushing, made a big generous loop at the end and came back. And uh, here it is coming back and it tied in about halfway down to the incoming thing. And this was a, this was a good design because when people were moving into uh, Cushing in the fall uh, in a car, they could just drive in and stop at the appropriate uh, entrance and move their stuff in and uh, other people could park around them. And when they were through, they could leave without having to turn around and fight incoming traffic or anything. Good design. But uh, it didn't have the quality of giving you a closed loop, okay? Kind of like a NASCAR track, <laughs> except small. And it also had a really bad problem, which is that there's a hell of a hairpin turn in it, okay? But in 1961, about half a dozen students who had sports cars, with the triumphs here, um, decided that, and, well, sorry, the semester was not over until June in those days. It, it was later than it is now. And so along about early May, when the sports pages were starting to talk about the Indianapolis 500, a bunch of students who had sports cars decided that, hey, you know what? We can have the Cushing 500. And the way you do this, it's only one car wide, okay? The way you do this is not to actually race around it. What you do is line up here to start, and this, they, got the, they got a green flag and a checker flag, okay? And the guy swings the green flag down, and his bunny here starts a stopwatch. And you start driving around, and you make three laps. And you have to make it on the third last lap, you have to make it around that hairpin turn one last time. And just as you get there, the checker flag comes down and the guy with the stopwatch gives you time. And eventually somebody is the winner because he has the least accumulated time, all right? Pretty good there. This was a lot of fun. Uh, it was done secretly because they were afraid the college would ban it. But notice that it drew, even with no announcement, it drew a modest crowd of witnesses. Uh, what it also drew was a hazard that was not photographed, but uh, these people were driving along pretty fast, right in front of Cushing, only maybe 10 feet from the windows on the first floor, and a number of insouciant Cushing residents mooned them as they were passing by. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they ran us. This was so popular that they thought the college would let it go, and they did. Uh, Doc Gilmer actually thought it was sort of fun. He was president at the time. And so the next year they set it up again 
and it was hugely popular. They got more entrance, and unfortunately, one idiot entered with the late 50s Plymouth, which steered about like a destroyer. And on one of the hairpin turns, he came around much too fast. But he might also have had refreshment first. He came around much too fast, rolled over, and the car skidded 50 feet across the uh, cushing lawn on its top. And at that point, Doc Emmer decided somebody was going to get hurt if they kept doing this. And so it only ran two years, but it is a, a fine piece of cooking tradition. Uh, okay, here's the dining hall, okay? The chairs there from the last man to live there as a residence. Um, <clears throat> this was built uh, parallel to Cushing, but a little further in. Uh, you know how carpenters built to be a sort of uh, U-shaped building with an open paws in it, except it's not really U-shaped, it's just sort of J-shaped because one leg is mostly missing. Well, the leg that's missing is where this was, okay? So that they built a uh, built carpet around that and then later tore this down. But this was a dining hall and they put it up first and it was very popular with students. Students really, I, these are young males, okay? Of course they liked the dining hall. Uh, <clears throat> but it was such an improvement over the song they had been eating in. So uh, <clears throat> they, in 1822, they started having meals here and they really liked that. But uh, the, you have to realize that if you have dining hall, you also have to have a kitchen. And I apologize for this picture, but it's the only aerial view I could find. This little piece back in the back here, was built in 1815 as a faculty residence. It was a little brick house, but a very small brick house. We don't waste money on these things. Um, and the, they had a faculty member living there, but they decided when they were put, going to put the uh, dining hall up in this general location, that they could save some money by just connecting them together and letting this be the kitchen instead of a faculty residence. And then the whole, uh, the whole uh, downstairs could be a dining hall, okay? So they built that, and here's what you get. And uh, the, as I say, the students like this a lot. And by 1836, they'd only been in it about, what, the students are feeling pretty good at this point because they have all the new buildings, okay? They have uh, the college, and they even at that point have the president's house and so on. <coughs> and uh, the, Everybody's in an upbeat mood, but suddenly in 1836, the nation is seized by the drama of the Texas War for Independence. And they even, nobody was publishing photographs those days, but they did publish woodcuts, which are, were only three or four days out of date. And uh, so picked, the big event in the Texas War for Independence was the defense of the Alamo, and there were pictures of the Alamo. <laughs> in the paper, and students looked at it and said, hey, that looked just like our dining hall. <laughs> so all those dining hall didn't have a name because no building had a name. It was called, the student called it the Alamo and it stuck. Uh, it stuck so well, this embarrassed the college because they didn't like having nicknames applied to serious uh, parts of higher education. So after the Civil War, the college tried to get rid of this by putting a false front on it, okay? Notice that here's the edge of the roof back here. But they haven't built any more building. It didn't literally just put up a false front like the sons and uh, old Western movies. And so this window and this one are totally fake. The one in the middle is real window, but anyway, they did that, and it was no longer the right shape to be the Alamo, okay? So maybe the students will stop calling it the Alamo. And in only a couple of months, a big windstorm came up and blew both of the ears off. So it was back to its original configuration, and the students laughed madly about it. And so it was continued to be called the Alamo until they took it down in 1980. Anyway, so the, there was one named building, but not through the college's efforts. Uh, here's the third one of Cushing's buildings. This is the president's house. 
And uh, ignore this part back here. If you just look at the house part, this is a, an architectural distinguished building. This is the right kind of place to bring potential donors to. This, this is nice. And Cushing did move in there, and uh, but it was it didn't have a name either. It was just the president's house. But of course, he left. Other presidents came in, and so on. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, but well, it was the president's house. So okay, and uh, that lasted until 1900 uh, when the College, uh, sorry, I need to, need to show you these first. There's a 1850s vintage photograph from about the same angle, but obviously further away. And you can see that very little has changed. The front porch here is a little different in that there are no steps up to it. It had an English basement, but if you walk in from the front, you had to go in the basement and walk flight of stairs to get to the uh, floor, uh, main living floor. Uh, but you look at that and you say, you don't, not a lot has changed. Um, this is a, a lousy photograph, but believe me, you don't find too many of these uh, at this age. Uh, this is the back side, okay? And it looks just like the front side, except now you have a set of steps going up back here. So somehow the back side has better access than the front side does. But anyway, that was the president's house, and it was a really nice place for the president to live until 1900. So that's say when the Board told the president he had to move out because they were going to use that for classes. He had to move out and move into Penshurst, which is the house on the corner of uh, Via Sacra, the road out in front here, and College Road right across from the uh, Kaifai house. And uh, this is an old picture I took shortly after it came at a time when it had a full length front porch, which is unwieldy. It, it, it really did ruin the architectural effect of the building. And it was not in too good a shape anyway. And so somewhere in the, I want to say 1980s, the college renovated and got this, which is what it looks like now. And this, okay, so th this also is nice presence house. So it stayed that way from uh, 1900 to 1939 when they changed presidents again. And the president that who came in said, I don't, I, I don't want to live in Pensers. I want to live in Middlecourt. And so they wanted him to come back. So they said, okay, Middlecourt was occupied by a faculty member at the time who got turfed out in a heartbeat. And uh, so the president moved in here and all of them since 1939 have lived there. Now, let me back a minute. Uh, here is the, uh, not the original president's house, which is a slum that Cushing refused to move into. Uh, but what is this giant thing sticking out the back? <coughs> Uh, this is bigger than the house is. Uh, this is a, about a 1970s view, and you notice that the walks have improved a lot since then. But um, <laughs> that's all right. Thank you. Uh, okay. Why is that there? Well, it's a men's college. Uh, it is full of young men who want some athletic outlet in the afternoons. And in the fall, you can play football, and they did on what we now have as a football field that was strictly picked up from the Civil War on. In the spring, you can play baseball, and we had a baseball field, but that's that's pretty trivial. You just need to reasonably fly a place for things that you put down for bases in your business. Um, nothing doing the winter. The winter is cold and wet, and you can't do something outside because it's it's just too nasty. So in 1891. And I will say, to be precise about it, in the winter of 1891, uh, Naismith invented basketball. Now, he's in Massachusetts, okay? It's, the weather there is even worse than the weather here in the winter. Uh, but it spreads like wildfire. And my, my basis for saying that is that in the fall of 1892, which is less than a year after it's invented, <coughs> I had Sydney group of students wrote a letter to the board of trustees pleading for a space to be made available in which they could play basketball in the winter. Well, at that point, uh, we haven't got to it yet. The, the college had just built its first academic building and had spent every penny they had on it and probably some pennies they didn't have. And they, there was nothing, they could not build anything. Now, what do you need for basketball? Well, 
you need a high ceiling, okay? This is not high enough. I mean, it's almost high enough if you're truly desperate, but in fact, it's not. It, it certainly has been 12 feet. You'd really like to be 16 or 20. But uh, what size does the court itself have to be? This has to be a pretty big room with this high ceiling. Well, now, 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 uh, the uh, NCAA standard basketball court size is 94 by 50 feet, okay? Yeah, whatever. Well, boy, is there not any place on the Hampton Sydney campus in 1892 that you can make available a high ceiling space that's 92 by 50, 94 by 50 feet. So what the board said was, well, we built a new chapel, and so we're not using the chapel in uh, Cushion Hall anymore. And so you can play basketball in there. So the students said, well, okay. And they moved in and they played basketball there from 1892 till about 1915. And this was seriously difficult because the space they had available to them in uh, Cushing was, you need 94 by 50 feet. The space they had available was 44 by 40 feet. It was not even big enough to play half court. And yet they played there for um, about uh, close to 20 years, uh, about 20 years. And after 1908, we were actually playing inter, uh, intercollegiate basketball in the uh, old chapel, okay? Bad situation. The, this, is, this is really embarrassing. So about 1914, the students again go to the board and say, please, please build us a place a real gymnasium we can play basketball in. And the college had a little more money at that point. So it said, okay, but we, yep, we can do that. Where do you want it? And everybody said, oh, I want you to put it at the bottom of the hill at the end of the, by the end zone for the football field. That, that would be just an ideal place to have a basketball gymnasium. Everybody except the president. The president was named Graham at that time, and he did not want this, sorry, he did not want the, uh, uh, oh, there we are. he did not want that house used as a president's house again, because he, he hadn't been turfed out, but his direct, his immediate predecessor had been, and who was really bad about it. And so he said, no, we're going to turn uh, Graham into, never mind teaching psychology there, which is what they're doing for a while. Never mind that, we're going to build a gym on the back of uh, Graham. And if the president says that's what he wants, then that's what you're going to get. Even though everybody on campus wanted it uh, where a Kirk Athletic Center is now. Uh, so the building. And as usual, uh, Hampton City ran out of money in the, on, in the process. So this is somewhat smaller than they set out to make it. Okay. Uh, the court in here was 68 by 39 feet. And if you remember any of the previous discussion, that's still too small and significantly so. Furthermore, you can't just paint it closer to the, paint the lines close to the wall because the lines were already within a foot and a half of the brick wall, okay? Now, where do you, how do you watch a game? Well, the balcony here, or th that is the big tall space, uh, actually had a second floor, but there was a giant hole in the middle of it. So what you had was a balcony that ran all the way around the gym, and it had a running track, indoor running track in it, which is uh, sloped at the ends, and so you had to be careful where you were. But the way you went to a basketball game was to go in this door, go up the steps here, to the second floor and go inside and watch the game down through the hole in the floor. Okay. And that was that was what we did from uh, 1916 to 1939. Uh, the, uh, but the, in spite of the fact that at that point, then said it was still being pretty flexible about the size of the court, it was still too small. And uh, in 1939, uh, the uh, 
president to then president. Uh, he had died and retired, and they went out to get a new president. And the one they got this time was uh, uh, Edgar Gammon, who had been in the class in 1906, okay, back when they were playing in the, in the uh, Cushing Chapel. And uh, Gammon had been a real jock. His nickname as a student was Rip, and he had 12 varsity letters. So uh, he was very interested in this basketball problem. And one of the conditions for taking the presidency was that you let me live in middle court, and that was fine. And the other condition was you immediately go to work on a new gym in the location it should have been at, because he had been here for that discussion. In 1915-16, he was the new uh, minister. He, he was alumnus of college, but he was also the new minister at College Church. But he didn't have any leverage, and he knew better to get into that argument. So he just watched sadly while they put the gym in the wrong place. He said this was going to be down at the end of the football field. So uh, <clears throat> the board went to work with a will, and... <clears throat> It was January when he came in and became president, and they played the first game of the season in December of that same year in the new gym. So they, they really built it fast. Uh, however, I have to say it again, they ran out of money. And uh, this building was a cupola right there, and they couldn't afford the cupola, so we, we got no cupola. Uh, what was immediately called, and they really meant it this time, Gammon Gym. This building would not have existed without Edgar Gammon, and so that's that's what it was for years until it was uh, remodeled and extended substantially to turn into Kirk Athletic Center. Now, this ran from 1939 to 1975, and uh, this is a lousy picture, but I want to show it to you to make two points. One is that they were still really close to the brick wall at the end, okay? And this is the end toward the campus, toward Cushing, that actually has a door in it. The other end didn't have any door. It was a blank brick wall, and you were pretty close to it when you were at the end. Not a foot and a half away, but still pretty close. Uh, but you worry about anybody who's driving the lane here and making a layup, because he's moving maybe 15 miles an hour, and he's gonna to have to stop and turn around in a very short distance or else spider himself all over the brick. So in the Graham Gymnasium, what they did was put in saloon doors, which swing very easily in both directions. And there was a little vestibule outside on each end, outside but also on the house end. And so if you were moving too fast to stop, you went through the doors, you had about eight feet to stop and turn around, you came back through the doors, pushed them out the other way, and got back to the game. And that was that was how you played there. Uh, not a long space here. The other thing I want you to notice is how short the pants were. Some of you I know are old enough to have seen those, but most people have not seen basketball pants that short. Uh, finally, in 1975, we did it right. This is uh, the present field house and uh, this is a picture I took over early, and the college had not paved the road to it yet or put in any parking. Also, did not yet have the uh, exercise room uh, sick out the center on this side. But at least this one has a court that is 94 by 50. Oh, sorry, Gamma Gym. Again, we ran out of money. Gamma Gym took advantage of a loophole in the NCAA rules, which said 94 feet, okay. Except if you're a high school, you can have 84 feet because a lot of high schools had small chimps. And so we built one that was 84 feet and thumbed our nose at the NCAA until this came along. Uh, now, let me back up to the late 1880s. College survived the uh, Civil War tolerably well. We never closed. Everybody else did, but we stayed open. Uh, and we actually got some more students through the 70s and early 80s. And Remember, everything is in the college, Cushing Hall. And if you get more students, A, you need more dorm rooms. Uh -huh. But more dorm rooms can only come from classrooms, and you also need more classrooms. Bad problem when you have enrollment increases in a one building campus, okay? So the college said, well, we got to build a, a real 
academic building. Uh, so let's start a quadrangle here. Let's build an academic building at the end of uh, Graham that faces the dining hall on the other end of, uh, sorry, at the end of Cushing, that faces the dining hall on the other end of uh, Cushing. So they put this up. Uh, this is a brick construction, went up 89.90. And I'm, I'm making the talk, I get to say things like this. I think this is a major candidate for the ugliest brick building on the East Coast. It was, this thing just looks obscene to me, but they were very proud of it. Now this was gonna be a science building, which let me think here, this is the third time Hampton Sydney has built a structure intended to have science labs in it. One is the wood shanty in the original campus. The other one is Cushing, which was explicitly supposed to have laboratories in. This was gonna be a science building. And so this is our third trial. And while it was still being designed, the bottom department sort of got wind of this and insisted that they had to get the first floor because they needed a really big uh, chapel for the morning chapel services. And they might put a classroom in there too. And so the bottom department got the first floor got here and the science departments only got the second floor because the third floor was also being used by somebody else. The third floor was divided between the college's two debating societies. The one we got now and it's competitor from the 19th century. Uh, when we didn't have uh, many social fraternities at all, most freshmen who came joined uh, debate society A or debate society B, I can never remember the names, and the reason for joining this is that each of them, the college did not have a library, but each of the uh, debate societies had its own library, which was kept under lock and key. And they each of them had about 2,500 books. So there was actually a halfway decent library available, just not, it just wasn't run by the college. But the college did have sense enough to think that what they ought to do was put one of the debate sides down in this end and give them a nice room, and the other debate side down in the far end and give them a nice room, and then the library problem would be solved. And, and it sort of was in a left-handed way. But at this point, this is not a big building if you look at it. I mean, it seems large and ugly, but it, it, in fact, in square feet, it's not that big. So it didn't, it helped but it was badly designed and badly constructed and discussion for its replacement started only 16 years after it was opened. It is as if we had opened Gilmore Hall in 2005 and we were now building Pauly, okay? <laughs> uh, so uh, if any, things went on here and uh, they didn't use it anyway. Uh, this is a picture postcard from the 1920s, which had been tinted, it's not color film. Uh, but here's Cushing back here, well, behind the tree. Uh, and uh, you can see the tracks from what is was going to be the Cushing 500 track, okay? People were, were depositing their kids by going up there and, and uh, this walk, uh, doesn't go the same place the walk goes now. This walk goes to the little gate in the iron fence, which is still there opposite the church manse, which appears to have one chunk of pavement going in two feet into the into this lovely green grass, and then there's nothing there but green grass, and you have no idea why it's there. But that, that was originally intended to let you get out uh, this building, which when they built it was called Memorial Hall because it still weren't naming buildings for people. The memorial was a memorial to the uh, alumni who had died in the Civil War. And if you get down to the memorial gate and look at the list of uh, Civil War participants, uh, the what, and remember that the college, most of the time before the Civil War, only had sort of 40 students a year, about 10 seniors. So every year you get 10 new alumni. 
Uh, you got 30 years worth of alumni, and that's 300 people. And if you look at that list, the number down there is amazing, close to 300. Uh, the participation was really, really high in Hamp City. Anyway, uh, it was Memorial Hall, and it's open in 1890, which is why in 1892 they didn't have any money to, to build a basketball facility. And um, the people start getting confused because there's this one big building back here that is the college, okay? And there's the other one that's called Memorial Hall. Is that part of the college or is it? I mean, what's going on here? And so the board decided that you should actually start naming buildings for uh, people who've been important with college. And of course they named the college, they renamed it Cushing for obvious reasons. Uh, the president, when Memorial Hall was built, was named McElwain, and so that became McElwain Hall. And, uh, yeah, well, it sat there and nobody was very happy with it. And uh, in the late World War I, about 1918, the college started building its fourth science building, okay, Bagby Hall. Most of you remember Bagby. Uh, and uh, that they did right. Uh, we'll, we'll come back and look at that. But for once, they, they did something on, on an ideal scale and ideally equipped for the job it had to do at that time. Uh, but what that means is in 1920, the science department moved out of uh, the second floor of uh, McElwain. The libraries, the, the base sites are already gone because in the meantime, the college had picked up the seminary property. We'll come back to that. But the, that meant that there was a library building that the seminary had built that they could simply use. So they confiscated the books from the uh, the base society libraries and created the Hampton Sydney Library out of it. And things went along decently well from there. But that meant the third floor was vacant. And the second floor is vacant. There's only the Bible people on the first floor. Well, no, wait a minute. When the science people moved out, some of the humanities classes in Cushing could move in, and so they did. But if you think the rooms were bad for science, they were really bad for humanities. And so the humanities complained incessantly about not having adequate facilities. And in 1935, uh, <coughs> Colonel Morton built Morton Hall, which was big and had just the right kind of thing for the humanities department and so all the humanities people moved out. This left the building vacant except for chapel services and never was a good looking building uh, and they uh, it, it sat there and people were used for chapel service and then in 1950 they built John's Auditorium and as soon as John's Auditorium moved, they moved chapel services over there. So at this point McElwain is empty and deserted and b g which does not have much space is storing lumber at the bottom of it okay that, that's the extent of what's going on and if you think about where it is it is absolutely defacing the camps at this point so in the spring of 1957 a group of soon to graduate seniors came up with the idea of beautifying the campus by removing McElwain Hall. And the way you remove McElwain Hall is to burn it to the ground. So they formed three committees. One was guys who were going to go in and actually light the fire about seven o'clock at night. Now, they're going to, they're, they want to completely destroy. I mean, they want the brick to turn into rubble. They want to completely destroy the building. And you can do that with a wood frame house, but bricks don't burn. The way you get a brick house to collapse in a fire is to have a raging inferno that gets to a really high temperature for several hours. That'll calcine the mortar, it'll lose the grip on the brick, and the whole thing goes blue, and you got rubble all over the ground. That's what happened. But to do that, you have to have the fire burning for several hours. The Hampton City at that point doesn't have a volunteer fire department, but Farmville has a fire department, and the students know that the college is immediately going to call Farmville, and the Farmville department is going to come out and uh, fight the fire. How will they do that? Where will they get water? Look at this picture. They're going to park the truck about here somewhere, and they're going to run homes out across in front of Cushing to the 
one tank at the far end, okay? And that's not a large water tank, but it's enough that they got a pretty good chance of putting the fire out if they get there early. So the students form committee two, which is football linemen. And their duty was to, on the given night, on D-Day, they were to just stay inside Cushing until the fire department got there and unrolled a uh, hose across the yard in front of Cushing and connected it to the tank. And then after it was connected to the tank, but before any water had gone through it, they were all going to rush out and stand on the hose. And there would be at that point something on the order of a ton and a half alignment standing on the hose. And that they didn't know much about hydrodynamics, but they did think that was probably enough to keep water from flowing through the hose. Okay. But it might not be. I mean, we need plan B. This really does have to work because we're only going to get one chance. So they formed committee three, which is people who lived in uh, Cushing anyway. Now, I told you that water pressure was always a problem for him Sydney until about 20 years ago. And what that meant was that Cushing at that point, of course, had standard facilities, but all the toilets were on the ground floor because that's the only place you get any water pressure. So the third committee was students who lived in uh, Cushing anyway, and they stationed one student at each toilet and told them to flush it and let it fill again, and then the student filled again, flush it again. And I want you to spend three hours standing there continuously flushing the commode, which will, of course, in only an hour or so, remove all the water from the tank anyhow. So they had a pretty good plan. And they, uh, <laughs> the night came, and there's a, at least one retired trustee of him sitting who claims to know who lit the fire, but he won't tell. Uh, here's the fire. Okay, and it was a raging inferno, as you can see. Uh, it also, interestingly enough, had quite a few students watching it as a bit of entertainment. But in the morning, it was smoking rubble. Okay, it worked. And this is only about a month before graduation. And the trustees are outraged with this, as you can imagine. And so in a couple of days, very soon, they have a meeting and they come in breathing flames. They are going to form a committee and find out who did this and sue him and his parents for the damages to the college. Um, okay, we knew that. And now, oh, Ben's a manager. How much hole are we in? How much is this going to cost the college? The business manager, who had been doing it for 30 years at that point, smiled amiably and said, well, I got a guy to come out from Farmville with a bulldozer and trucks and load up all the rubble and haul it away, which it had only been three or four days, but it was gone by that time. Uh, loaded it up and hauled it away, and, and he charged $10,000. But, he said, for years the college has carried $50,000 fire insurance on the building, so we're ahead $40,000. <laughs> and at that point, the trustees suddenly forgot to be mad anymore. And they never had the committee to find out who did it. <laughs> they just gave up. They said they unified the campus. So McElwain came and went. Uh, now, uh, here's another postcard from the 20s. And uh, in the back of horses, Grant was the influence gymnasium on the back. And this is Bagby, which at the time was brand new. And this was a really nice science building. There are three sciences. Chemistry on the top floor, bombs in the middle, physics on the bottom floor, and the basement is storage for everybody. And given the college's enrollment in uh, 1915, 1920, that period, we had about 150 students. And if you got about 150 students, then that tells you how many faculty you're going to have in departments. And what that meant was we had one chemist and one biologist and one physicist. And each of them was going to get his own floor on this building. So they designed it, it was a really nice design. Did not have a car running down the middle, which uh, may be a surprise to the faculty members who've taught in it recently. Um, instead, on the backside, it just had a really nice faculty office. And this was the first time the college had ever built faculty offices. They didn't have any in Cushing, didn't have any in McElwain. And, and for 15 years, 
only three science faculty had it, and all of the humanities people did not have offices because Morton hadn't opened yet. And I have to think there were some bad feelings there, but I've never heard anything about it. Uh, <clears throat> but each office had its own little restroom, taught it didn't flush very well, but had its own little restroom, and a small research lab next to it, which was yours in class, didn't meet in there. This was first class, and they put in good equipment. Anyway, nice science building, but if you think about it, that's Hampton City's fourth attempt at building a facility for uh, science laboratory instruction. A uh, couple more pictures. Here's, here's one I took, and the, the building is not surprising at all, but I would like to call your attention to that sugar maple. Uh, it was the only sugar maple on campus, and it was that fantastic orange color every fall. Amazing. Uh, here's a winter picture of it, take it from uh, basically the parking lot of the administration building uh, before the sun came up on a winter morning when it, there'd been an ice storm. And the big thing about that is, yeah, Bagby is Bagby, but all of these trees, this one right here, the one behind it, this one right here, this one back here, the big one over here, all those trees are gone now. The only one of the, the only tree in that picture is still there is this little glob right here, which is one of the two trees in front of uh, John's auditorium. But so things do change, but somehow the trees change faster than buildings. Do. And this one I just put in because I like the picture. Uh, this is a summer evening. Uh, now, okay, let's let's go look for the other. 1820s construct big building. What's going on here? Well, remember the religious frenzy and the uh, tremendous religious emphasis in the curriculum? In 1820, when they appointed Cushing president, some people made inquiries and discovered that not only was he not a minister, I mean, hey, we knew that bad already, he's a scientist. This is very, very suspicious. This, no scientist is a good person. We're looking at this a little more. He's not a member of any Christian denomination. And he has never been baptized. This man is a tool of Satan. What they, not sure they said that, but what they did say was that he will secularize the curriculum. Okay. Which at that point was heavily loaded toward religious topics because that's who they were graduating. And they were right, he did secularize curriculum. He dragged him kicking and screaming into the 19th century. Um, <clears throat> but uh, there had been discussion all along, well, not all along, but for 10 or 15 years of how maybe Hampton really should have a graduate seminary with it, like Princeton did. At Princeton, actually, they built the seminary first, the college came later, but anyway, it, it, Maybe Hampton City could support a graduate seminary, which would be its own institution. Well, that discussion suddenly got frenzied in 1820, okay? And uh, they went to the Senate of Virginia, of the Presbyterian Church, and said, I want you to build us a seminary. And the Senate of Virginia said, I understand where you're coming from. We're, we're really supportive, but we don't have quite enough money. We could maybe give you half of it. And so they said, okay, let's go to North Carolina. But Hampton is in Southern Virginia anyway. It's kind of centrally located for Virginia and North Carolina. And maybe we can get, get both senates to fund it. And then we'll call it Union Seminary. And so they did. And Union Seminary is still here, or not Hampton here, but it's still in Virginia. But the Union has nothing to do with the Civil War. Um, but while Hampton College was building Cushing, the college, uh, the seminary was taking uh, North Carolina Senate money and Virginia Senate money and building almost an identical building. It was going to be the whole educational institution. It was going to have uh, student dorm rooms in it and at least a few faculty uh, rooms. And then it would have a big chapel. Uh, the chapel is really more important for the seminary. And it would have a big chapel, which is now the branch to Friends Lounge. And everything would be there. Well, except for the, we'll have to do something about police aid, but we'll come back to that. Um, 
So they were building this while uh, and, and they wanted it as close as possible to Hamp City. They really didn't want an identity of purpose, except that because this had its own trustees, all of whom were uh, preachers, this would guarantee that uh, Christian education <coughs> continued un, unimpeded by some atheist. Um, and they wanted to be as close to Hampton Sydney as you can, but remember Hampton Sydney, this is 1820. In 1814, Hampton Sydney bought all the land down to uh, Vias Opera, down to Sailor's Ditch. And so they did the only thing they could do, which was buy the land on the south side of Sailor's Ditch and rename the street. Um, and so they built this while Hampton Sydney was building uh, Cushing. And so Hampton Sydney ultimately wound up having two classic 1820s buildings that are the same size with the same purpose and they're 300 yards apart. No, nobody else does that. <laughs> I mean, think about UVA and UNC and all these places where there are a couple old buildings and they're right in the middle and then you build newer stuff out around them, not here. Uh, <clears throat> which the, the president will be familiar with the fact that this kind of screws you up when you're picking, picking new construction sites. Okay, <clears throat> anyway. Um, the uh, seminary didn't just build this building. They also built a faculty residence next to it, Penshurst, on the east side, and one next to it, Middlecourt, on the west side. And those were not particularly intended for the president or anything. Those were just nice faculty residences. Uh, but the seminary thrived uh, pretty well. And in the 1880s, they were also running out of dorm space. So they got Virginia and North Carolina to agree to uh, build dormitories, but this time they were running into financial trouble, run, get donors. And so instead of building brick buildings, they could only build frame ones. And furthermore, uh, they needed, they didn't just need one of these. Well, you recognize what that is. They didn't just need one of these, they needed two of them in terms of bed capacity and so on. And so they built a second, house from the same plants right here, right next to it, only about 15 feet away. Same plants, two houses, okay, and this is uh, about 1890. And the reason they were having, at that point, they were having financial problems is that the Presbyterian Church had been taken over by a movement called Social Gospel, which the thrust of which was you had to go reach the unchurched people in the cities particularly poor folks, and you, you had to bring the gospel to them. And you can't serve poor folks in the cities if you're 65 miles from the closest city, okay? Just, just doesn't work to be out in the middle of the tobacco fields. So what we need to do is to move the seminary from Ham City to Richmond, and then we can carry out the social gospel. Well, as you can imagine, not everybody thought this was a good idea. About half faculty wanted to move, about half wanted to stay put. The board was significantly in favor of staying put with only a little bit of possibly move. But, uh, okay, this is 1888, 89, 90, 91 in there someplace. Time passes, the pressure gets greater, and in 1896, they decide to move. And when they move, everything becomes vacant. And if you think about it, there is nobody they can sell it to but Ham City College. I mean, boy, is there nothing else you can do with that property except for Ham City to use it. But this is right after Ham City has built McElwain. They don't have any money. Sorry, did I say that before? Um, and so Ham City said, sorry, we can't, we'd love to have it, we can't do it. Ah, now it gets sneaky. In the class of 1857, there had been a student from a family, all of whom, all the males of whom went here, named Venable. This was Dick Venable. And he graduated in 1857. And if you think about the dates there, he, he was just the right age to go in the Confederate Army. And he did, and he got made it up to major and made it through the war. And at the end of the war, uh, he didn't see a bright economic future for Virginia since their economic system had just gone away. And so he went to Baltimore and he went to work for the uh, Port Authority. And in no time he was running the Port Authority. And he was a 
very smart, dynamic young man, and he improved the port like crazy. And Dickon with the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad to run the BO rails right out on the dock. And in no time, he had Baltimore built up to being the second largest port on the East Coast. And, and he made a bunch of money at the same time, okay? And after a while, this all started seeming insane, and he was tired of doing it. And he, he had these investments that were paying off. I know what I'll do. I'll move back to Hampton, Sydney, and I'll buy a house there. And I'll live there and I'll spend my time thinking of ways to improve him, Sydney to be the best small college in the South. So he did. Where he moved in was essentially where the counseling center is now. It was a big old early Victorian house. And he moved in there in the 80s sometime. And when the Senate sold everything, he'd been there almost 10 years. And he was definitely plugged in at this point. And the con said, we don't have any money. And Dick Venable said, tell you what, um, you college find out what the sale price is for those buildings. And without mentioning anything else about it, then come back and tell me what the sale price is. And he thought it was about $10,000 and for us. Uh, come back and I'll give you the money for them, okay? Or, or rather, I'll buy them and, and then I'll give you the buildings. So they did, and the seminary didn't have much choice, so they sold it, and Hampton bought all the buildings with Venable's money. Only Venable was a little bit sneaky. He gave the college all of the buildings along Via Soccer west of College Road, but he didn't give them these two buildings, the two identical houses, the, the Kaif House and, and the one right next to it that's not there anymore. Uh, he kept those. He did give them Atkinson, the current administration building, which had been the Tada dining hall for the seminary. And the Collins couldn't think what to do with that. So they left it locked, after they bought it, they left it locked up for about three years before they could find anything to do with that space. But <clears throat> Dick Venable kept these two houses because what he was going to do was build a big connector between the two, okay, to turn them into one building. And then even that whole thing, which was now pretty good uh, square footage, that whole thing was gonna be a hotel. And he approached the college about this and what did they think? And the college said, oh, nobody comes here. <laughs> Who's gonna stay in your hotel? And he said, oh damn, or something like that. And so, now, now he's stuck with these two houses, which he, legally he can spend money connecting if he wants to, but boy, is that not going to get him anything. So at that point, uh, there's a bunch of young alumni in Richmond who are, have been frustrated. And in fact, Dick Venable himself was frustrated in the 1850s by a rule that the uh, religious administration of Hampton City College had put in in the 1790s, which is that you can't have, no students can dance anywhere on the campus. Dancing is sin. It is sex, sex, music, and we're not going to have any young men's moral fiber deteriorated by dancing at Hampton City. So no, you can't have dances here. Now, all through the 19th century, there were protests about this. There were even a riot or two. And the board hung on to it grimly. You will not dance in Hemp Sydney. Well, if Hemp Sydney had been a town, it probably wouldn't have mattered because somebody would have built a dance hall across the street. And, you know, you, so you just schedule the, the dance across the street. Not at Hemp Sydney. There is no across the street. Well, wait a minute. Venom has just bought these. These are clearly not seminary property anymore. And he very carefully did not give them to the college. So these two houses are not on college property. Mind you, they're only 50 feet away from it, but still. So the Richmond alumni formed a club called the Comedy Club. Not comedy, ha ha, but comedy, high intellectual friendship. And the Comedy Club went to Venable and said, how about selling us the, the one that is now missing, the one closer to college? for a favorable price and we'll try to raise some money and build a big dance for building on the back of it. 
and then students can have dances there, even though it, even though it's right on the college campus, because ta-da, it's not on the college campus. And <clears throat> Venable thought this was such a great idea that he sold them the building for a fraction of its worth, and then he paid for the pavilion, okay? Because <laughs> he had wanted to dance too when he was student. Uh, so here we have a building that was called the Comedy Club, and uh, students actually joined it. Um, and uh, from 1900, when it was finished, to 1940, it was the big student entertainment facility. It was... Uh, it, everything else dwarfed by comparison. And Cindy set up a remarkable set of high tone dances in particular. There was one that was held the weekend before uh, spring exam, final exam started called Finals. And they got uh, nationally well known bands, swing bands to come in and play. And uh, girls came from all over. I don't know where they stayed, but they came from all over. And uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, the, they had this all set lined up for spring 1940. And the night before the day on the evening of which the dance would occur, somehow the Connor Club burned to the ground. In the morning, there's embers there, nothing else. And the college, in an amazing display of efficiency, had a telephone meeting of the board, which decided in less than 30 minutes to do away with the ban on dancing, which meant that. They could now have the dance in Gamma Gym, which was only six months old, and this, this would work fine, and it did, and that was the end of that. And the comedy club was never rebuilt, but it's an important bit of Lost Ham City nonetheless. Uh, here's the spot where the comedy club was. Uh, it's that little building. Uh, almost immediately after it burned, the college bought it, bought the land from the college club in order to put a post office there because the post office had been inside the college shop and there just wasn't room for it there. So, okay, build that. And the next slide is not a very good photograph, but I want to show you what happened next because when the college in the 70s moved the post office to the basement of John's Auditorium for reasons I'm not too clear about, um, the museum wanted to take this over, but this was such a small building that it wasn't even enough room for something as modest as the Hampton Sydney Museum. So they got permission to add on a wing at the back and extend the front a little bit. And this is what it looks like now, but I wanted you to see that they extended the front, but here's where the old slates meet the new slates, and here's where the old brick meets the new brick. And so they didn't add very much there at all, but uh, it's, it is what happens to buildings. They change their purpose. Uh, one more thing that the seminary did was to build this house down here. You recognize that, it's the Maples, okay? Yeah, right next door. Uh, this was in 1890 when the social gospel debate was going on and everybody was going crazy about that. And they had a nationally recognized flamboyant young theologian who got a lot of national attention in church circles who man wanted to move to Richmond. And the board members who didn't want to move to Richmond said to themselves, if we build him a really nice house and give it to him free, he will move in and that will that'll keep him from wanting to go to Richmond so bad. So in 1890, they built the Maples. And it's, in my opinion, it's a lousy place to have as an academic building, but if you didn't have all those partitions in it, it'd be a really nice house, okay? And so here it is back here. But they had done the best they could to make it attractive, but they did one more thing to put a maraschino cherry on top of the icing, okay? They put a gazebo out in the front yard. And that gazebo, in five years, the seminary moved anyway because he didn't change his mind just because he moved in the nice house. And so we had that building there with a sort of meaningless gazebo in front of it. And uh, here's the gazebo close up. And about 1980, the college finally gave up and tore the gazebo down. But anyway, uh, here's the bell tower. Uh, you can hardly see it in there, partly because of these lights, but partly because it was really dark in there. They had uh, huge ground seeders 
around the outside here. And there were big trees hanging over it. And the ground seed was so big that the guy who rang the bells could hardly get in the middle to, to uh, pull on the handle. Uh, but okay, that's that's what they had. And that's the bell tower went up in the somewhere in the late 30s. And before that, we'd always had the bell, but it was on a post over by the entrance to Graham. Anyway, uh, here's the important building. Uh, this is Colonel Morton's contribution in 1935 or 30, I think 35. And this is what it looked like before the dining hall and before there was any pavilion out there. This is a, what's happened to this thing? Yeah. Sorry, the battery died. I'll talk louder. Um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, Morton Hall basically looked out on a scrubby little pine forest between them and the lake and there was nothing down here of any interest okay and of course they built the dining hall and built the plaza out there and this is what it looks like now and it, it is a nice effect uh here's the other side after they had cleared all the trees and uh ground cedar away from the bell tower but before they had put the uh extension on the front and frankly i think this is a better looking building then than it is now. Uh, here's one you almost certainly have not seen. Well, a few of you have. This is Restover. This was a faculty residence which was kind of behind the administration building. It had a garage, as you can see there, and uh, the driveway for the garage ran right up beside the cemetery here, and that driveway is now the driveway into the parking lot for the administration building. And Faculty members lived there for a few years and moved on. Uh, I lived there for four years. Uh, and anyway, it was weird because uh, it had originally, well, here's a better picture of where it was. Sorry, back up. Uh, here's the administration building. Here is rest over the house. And originally it was not there. It was a store and it was right out at the street. And I think it was unpainted, but even if it was painted, it looked awful because it didn't belong to the college. And the guy who owned the store didn't bother keeping it up. And so somewhere around uh, the twenties, the college bought it from him. Well, it was very popular because it was the only place you could get any junk food, right? And uh, <laughs> the first electric light bulb on the Hampton Sydney campus went on in the showroom of that thing when it was out at the street, right? <laughs> And, uh, but they bought it, moved it about 150 feet back so it wouldn't look like it was part of the college and painted it. And it was okay as a, a uh, house, except if you lived there, the house suffered from having been moved so that all the pieces had come loose. There were cracks everywhere. And in the winter, cold breezes blew through all the time. But anyway, it was, it was certainly very convenient. Uh, but uh, eventually, they put the business office in there for a while, then they put the police headquarters in there for a while, and then they gave up and tore it down. So it's not there at all anymore. Uh, here's the lawn. Well, it's early spring and the grass hadn't started growing yet, but here's the lawn between John's Auditorium and the street. And this is here so you'll realize what the lawn in front of Pauli is going to look like because the front of Pauli Science Center has been located so as to be exactly aligned with the front of John's. So that's how much grass you're going to have in front of uh, Pauli Science Center. But I would also call your attention to the fact that there aren't any holly trees down here. This, this is, you can't see anything down there because there's a complete barrier of uh, 30 foot high holly trees. Uh, that building also is not Brown Student Center, it's Eggleston Library, we'll come back to that. And this white thing down here is not Gilmer, which is not white. Uh, it's that house on the other side of Gilmer, that residence, because at this point, Gilmer's not there yet. Uh, here's Gilmer when it's just been built and the foliage hadn't grown anywhere. Look, it looks actually kind of funny <laughs> in, in, with no clothes on. Uh, now we get to the uh, seminary dining hall, otherwise known as Atkins or the administration building. Uh, this is its 
former guys when the whole thing, when it didn't have no shutters on the windows and the whole thing was covered in ivy, an interesting effect. Uh, here it is from the other side in a more modern picture. And I would like to call your attention. Come on. Uh, to the front chimney up here. What is that thing on the front chimney? Uh, I got an enlargement of this. There it is. What that is, is Hampton Sydney's first attempt at street lights. Hampton Sydney is a really dark place at night. In the 19th century, when you only got candles, it's really dark. And even if the moon is out, it's only open down about as far as uh, sort of where Gilmer is now. And beyond that, it's completely overgrown. And moon or no moon, it, it is so dark back there that people walking in opposite directions at night have been known to bump into each other, but they can't see somebody who is only six inches in front of them. <clears throat> so we really need some kind of lights. People said street lights, and the college looked into the price of street lights, and putting in a street light system was going to be really expensive. So they said, well, I tell you what, we can put a, a carbon arc spotlight on the front chimney of the administration building and carefully aim it so it shines down via soccer. And because carbon arc lights are very powerful, it will light the street who knows how far. Well, here's how far. Uh, this is a current picture, and of course that's Mort's Library and Gilmer, but here's the street, okay? And notice that right down here at the little cemetery, there's a hill that is so small you wouldn't notice it, but on this side, the light is going to shine. And once you get over that hill, ain't no light going to shine anymore. And that's exactly how far the uh, spotlight shone when they were using it in the 20s and 30s. Uh, so, OK, this street out in front here is called Via Sacra. What's the informal name of the lower part of the street with all the trees over? Black bottom, OK? That is not an ethnic description. It's because when the sun goes down, it's really black, and it still is. <laughs> anyway, uh, so much for uh, street lights. Uh, talk about basketball facilities. So let, let's look at football just for a minute. Here's the uh, current football stadium. Very nice facility by Division Three standards. Uh, notice, I mean, you know this, but it runs all the way from the street out here down to the uh, straight away of the running track. And come on. Here's the stadium before the current stadium. Okay. This is Hundley Stadium, which was built in 1964. And notice that it's up at the top of the slope, and there's about 50 feet of grass down here in front of it. Okay. And this is taken during a game, and uh, people, it's early in the season and it's hot, and nobody wants to sit in the sun. And so people are sitting in the shade over here in the shade over here and a big bunch sitting in the shade out on the slope here. And that, that's, that's the way that's done. Uh, incidentally, I would call your attention to one of the people who doesn't care anything about watching the game. Uh, here's the crowd and you, you can see this, this is a pretty nice way to watch the game. Uh, that's the uh, scoreboard, which is a little primitive by current standards. Uh, now, 50 feet of grass in front of the stands. Young men between ages seven and 11 don't want to sit around and watch somebody else play football. They want to play football themselves. And so every game played in Hunley Stadium had a kiddie game going on in front of it. And if, if Ham Sydney was getting hammered, sometimes he watched the, the kiddies instead of the real game. Uh, something we used to do and don't anymore is have high schools come in and uh, give a band concert at uh, halftime, and that's what it looked like. Let me call your attention to the fact that there is absolutely nothing showing behind those trees on the far side. No field house. Uh, here's the game itself. Yeah, get a pretty good view of that. Uh, now, last pass here. This is the football stadium before Hundley Stadium, and notice Back up, damn it. Notice that uh, 
it's not inside the running track at all. This is uh, bleachers sitting on the ground inside the running track. And I never saw a game there, but it you had to have had a really good <laughs> close up of the game. Um, libraries. Here's Walks Library, really great facility. This is ranked the, about the 10th best library, an undergraduate institution in the country. Uh, really nice. Before that, we had Eggleston Library, which was where Brown Student Center is now. And it was pretty much the same size and had pretty much the same footprint, but it was torn down in order to, uh, after we got boards, it was torn down in order to build Brown Student Center. <clears throat> and before we had Eggleston, we had the Seminary Library, which interestingly enough is called the Brown Memorial Library. <laughs> well, and uh, now this was only the front part, only the little part up here. After Hampton Sydney, after the college got it, they later built on the uh, section in back, and they used it as a library for uh, until about 1960, uh, and then changed it to a dining hall, which is why they needed the space on the back, and then finally it became a fine arts center. But that's uh, <coughs> that's where uh, Hampton Sydney's library started. Here's the Brown Student Center. You know what that looks like. That's only four years old, five years old. Anyway, pretty new. Uh, and, you know, it's a nice facility. Let me call your attention to the architecture of the tail just for a minute. It's two stories, uh, symmetrical design, three windows on each side, uh, got a Greek Revival pediment on the front with four big two-story pillars and they're paired, okay? They, it, it, it is, it's what Hampton City would do, okay? Now, keep that in mind and look at this architect's drawing. This is for a student center that was going to be built at Hampton Sydney 90 years ago, okay? <laughs> 1929. Uh, it's two stories, uh, three windows on each side of the portico, paired pillars, they don't have a pediment up there and they do have a cupola on top, but other than that, it's like being the same building. In fact, they got this big extension out back, which is exactly like where we have the Tiger Inn now. So I, somehow things change, but ideas don't change much. But let me call your attention to the last word in the caption they were gonna have the million dollar campaign in 1929. And with the money, they were gonna build this. I don't know where they were gonna build it, but they were gonna build it and believe me, they didn't. Because two weeks after they announced the campaign, uh, Wall Street had Black Friday and the Great Depression started. And ain't nobody raised money at that point and the million dollar campaign just went away. Uh, we're, we're getting down to little stuff, I'm almost through. Uh, this, you know about the historical marker down at the administration building. Uh, this is not the one you can read now. This is the one we used to have, went up in 1940. But it said, right up the top, founded in 1776, okay? That is not true. We opened for business in November of 1775. And in terms of any kind of realistic founding, it was six months to a year before that. And Professor Brinkley, who was here for many years, could not stand that numerical error on the historical marker. And so eventually he paid to have a new marker cast with 1775 on it. So it would have the date right. And while he was at it, he changed the wording a lot too. The wording is now significantly different from that wording, but he got what he wanted. Uh, uh, customs change. This is the 1964 uh, faculty line lined up to march into graduation. We're, we're just about to have commencement. So everybody's got their gown on and so on. And what they're going to, this is on the sidewalk that goes from the administration building out to the street. The real sidewalk that goes along the street had students on it. And the fact that we're going to march out in the street, students are going to march behind them. They were going to march down via opera. Come on. Uh, and everybody was going to walk in John's Auditorium and have the ceremony there. 
Now, I point out to you that this was June, not May, and everybody has a fairly heavy weight white gown on top of the regular clothes, and that there are, at this point, counting parents, about 600 people inside John's Auditorium, which is not, not only it's not air conditioned, it wasn't. It also didn't have any ventilation. The fans that were up there, they were later. What you breathed when you went in John's Auditorium was somebody's hiccup from last week. And this is in June. And as one who marched in that cotton picking uh, procession, I can tell you that it got really, really, really hot in there. <laughs> All the faculty members who think they've gotten hot at commencement, they don't know nothing. <laughs> anyway. Uh, uh, about 1970, we started the Edson Volunteer Fire Department. They got an army surplus truck and painted red, and they wanted somebody to letter the doors. And I was pretty good at this at the time. And I said, I'll paint the doors for you. But I think we should use this is this is a really nice organization. It's fa staff and faculty and students all in this together. And what we have is a liberal arts fire department. We need a liberal arts slogan on the truck. So I got Brinkley to translate Hampton Sydney Volunteer Fire Department in Latin. And <laughs> here it is. Hampton Sydney, obviously, volunteers instituted in adversity to fires. <laughs> and I had that on both doors. And I thought that was a real triumph. And people thought it was sort of funny. But in only about two years, they wrecked a truck and they didn't want that on the next one door. So <laughs> that was it. Uh, uh, here's the last one, okay. This is about three o'clock on a fall afternoon. This is College Road. Uh, the driveway on the right is going in. It's the one that goes in between the uh, health center and the counseling center. The driveway on the left, the one that goes back to B&G and the, the uh, Venable parking. And there are no cars. Furthermore, there haven't been any for some time because the place is covered with leaves. And the dog, who was our bass hound, died a natural death without ever being hit by a car. And he never did learn not to walk in the <coughs> middle of the street. It used to be really quiet here. And that is kind of a feature of him sitting that's lost. Now, I said it was the last. If you give me about two more minutes, uh, I want to show you the progress on the uh, Pauley building. Uh, this is. John's Auditorium, of, uh, sorry, good, you idiot. This is Bagby, and it's a picture I took in uh, Christmas break of 1964. And it looks just like Bagby always did, all right? Let me call your attention to this little sidewalk runs down here, which basically, if you think about where it was, it took you from Venable, where a lot of people lived, to the basketball games in Graham. And so that's why, that's why it was put up when uh, Bagby was built. So concrete walk down there. Now, the next slide is basically the same view, except I've moved a little bit and I'm now standing right in the middle of the, that sidewalk, but on the uh, venerable side. This is March of last year, March, 2020. And Bagby is still there. Uh, Graham is still there. Walk is going back there. Only thing they've been doing up here is uh, moving phone lines and uh, computer fiber optics and that kind of thing. Uh, so now let's go ahead with this. Here's the first of April, plus or minus a day or two, because I have to wait for a clear day. Uh, nothing much happened except they put a fence up. Here's May. Nothing much happened except they put a sign on the fence. Here's June. Oops. <laughs> It turns out you can tear these buildings down really fast, all right? <laughs> and uh, I was so impressed that they still had all the uh, construction equipment out there, but they were about to move that. And so about a week later, I went up, poked the camera through the fence and took this picture. And what you can see, of course, is what used to be the Bagby basement, but I like to think of it as Bagby Ravine. Oh. So then they started working it. Here's the 1st of July. They're starting to dig for the basement of the new building. First of August, first of September, first of October. <laughs> They're still digging that basement out. Uh, but notice now there's some uh, utility thingies, those white pipes poking up through the bottom there. They're almost through with this. Uh, here's 
early in November. And now what you see over there is, uh, I wait a little bit too late on this, but what you can see is the plywood forms for the concrete basement that they're going to pour. Uh, here's December. Uh, the basement has been poured and they, they're starting on putting the uh, seal framework up. Here's 1st of January, stairwells and elevator. Order. Here's February and they're putting the seal work up. Here's March, April, May, June, July, August, and September. And that really is the end of it. And I do thank you for coming. I'm sorry I've taken so long, but uh, thanks again for coming. If I wouldn't. I would say I would answer questions, but you sat here too long anyway. The, uh, there, there's a 90 minute rule. Everybody's saying it gets tired in about an hour and a half. And it's been actually a little longer than that. So thanks for coming. And uh, if you have some question, I, I might know 15% of the answer. So I'll, I'll be glad to try to answer. But thanks for coming and good night. <laughs>